started out, you always start out one of these lectures with jokes. But given the fact that I can't tell if anybody thinks my jokes are funny, <laughs> I'm going to dispense with that um, this go round. So we're just going to get into the meat of the matter. If you could uh, show the first slide, Jenny. Okay. Um, when you're talking about estate planning, you're talking about really four primary documents. There are others, but these are the four you really want to pay attention to. We're going to go uh, over each of these in the next few slides. But it's the durable power of attorney, the advanced directive or healthcare directive, the will and the living trust. So if you could uh, go to the first next slide, Jenny. Maybe should, should I just go beep? And then, no, anyway, durable power of attorney. The durable power of attorney uh, means you are acting on behalf of someone else. You write out a, a document called a power of attorney. You can find a lot of these forms. Attorneys can give them to you. Uh, the word durable means that it is effective even if the person giving it, I'm gonna say you in this case, uh, is, becomes incapacitated. Then the power of attorney lasts even through the incapacity. And that's why it's called the durable power of attorney. But it basically appoints everyone, someone to act on your behalf for all decisions and mainly for business and investment decisions. Maybe you wanna sell real estate, things like that. Um, the uh, healthcare decisions, however, are made pursuant to the next document we're gonna talk about, the advanced directive. But the durable power of attorney, there's really two types. One can be effective immediately. An example of that is maybe you're going out of town and uh, you want to sell some property and you're not going to be there. Well, you might want to give someone else a power of attorney uh, to sign on your behalf. Um, if you do that, make sure the power of attorney has the legal description of the property in the power of attorney. But uh, that's just a, a, an effective power of attorney. Some people don't want to deal with uh, the second type of power of attorney, which is only becomes effective if you become incapacitated. So it's kind of sitting there and it's called a springing document because it, uh, it springs into being when you become incapacitated. Someone then has the capacity to act on your behalf. So uh, you can decide uh, which one you want. This one, the second one, when you uh, become incapacitated is when it becomes effective that requires a determination of incapacity by some third party. Sometimes it's uh, by the person who has been appointed, but people don't really look kindly on that because it uh, gives that person a little bit too much power to use the power of attorney, perhaps for uh, bad purposes. So um, basically, uh, if there is an incapacity clause in the power of attorney, it is uh, generally decided by a, a primary physician of the person that is doing the appointing. So uh, you'd have it as the uh, incapacity as determined by a doctor somewhere. Um, the power of attorney only lasts until you die. Uh, at that point, um, you know, the other estate planning documents um, uh, take over, but the durable power of attorney is probably uh, one of the most important documents, even, even sometimes more important than some of the estate, other estate planning documents, because they can get so much done while the person's still alive. You can also write anything you want in here, uh, as long as it's legal, but um, you can give your uh, attorney, that's who it's called, attorney in fact, um, a broad power to act with your assets. So it's a really important document. Um, of course, the person has to be um, of sound mind to execute it. But if the person does execute that, um, it really saves a lot of money. Uh, you may avoid what's called a guardianship, which involves a court proceeding. A lot more expensive, a lot more complicated, a lot court filing documents. But this is a durable power of attorney. One document is all you need. I will uh, give a warning that Sometimes um, institutions that you deal with do not honor a power of attorney that is drawn up by someone else. And so they'll insist upon their own forms. But uh, if you get one generated by an attorney that uh, you know, looks, uh, looks, looks like the person knows what they're doing, uh, it should be honored anywhere. So 
That's the first estate planning document I want to discuss. The second one. I have a quick question for you, Rich, actually, that yes. our participants might have, because we get this question at the library a lot okay. where people come in and they just say, I need the form for power of attorney. Right. Is there a, a template form for this kind of document or how do people, how would they find that or, or get one of these drafted? You well, there's a, there's a, a template form of a place called Stevens Ness, S-T-E-V-E-N-S. N-E-S-S. -S. It's an outfit out of Portland. I think they closed their downtown store because of the rioting over there. But um, um, you can look them up on the internet and they have power of attorney forms. And those are very, very good because they also comply with Oregon law if you're in Oregon. But um, LegalZoom probably has some, you could probably Google durable power of attorney and probably have some forms. Uh, so uh, you know, if you want to do it yourself, that's fine. If you're dealing with a uh, large, uh, you know, high valued piece of property, you may not want to do that. Uh, but it, you know, it depends upon your intelligence and in drawing up the document too. So uh, you, that's the places you can get the forms primarily. Okay, let's move on. Is that okay, Jenny? Let's move on to advanced yeah. directive or health. It's called uh, either advanced directive or healthcare directive. Now, the good news about these is that you can get them at hospitals and uh, you don't need a, an attorney to draw this up for you. It's uh, the language of these documents comes straight from Oregon statutes so that um, there is uh, nothing for an attorney to really uh, deviate from or create new language for this document. It's the same document everywhere you look at it. But this document uh, primarily uh, accomplishes two things. First, uh, it's like the durable power of attorney, but it limits the decisions to healthcare decisions. So you appoint someone else, you can appoint an alternate as well uh, to make healthcare decisions for you. And this will give you the authority to do that. Um, second thing is it allows you to express your wishes about life support. When you want to terminate life support measures, no long, longer want to live uh, under that condition, those conditions. Uh, you can also express your wishes about hospice measures and you can get as detailed as you want. These documents uh, um, at the end have a uh, blank or a place where you can put additional wishes. So, so you can be as specific as you want. And depending on your family and the doctor, uh, that situation, um, you know, those wishes will, should be carried out. So again, these can be uh, obtained at any hospital. And uh, I think probably many of you might have already uh, been acquainted with these. They often ask for them whenever I check into St. Charles. So. Um, uh, but this is the, uh, the quick and easy document. And, you know, people th may think these are two of the minor, more minor documents in estate planning, but really the durable power of attorney and the advanced directive, when you think of it um, uh, in, the, in the situation where death may be imminent, these are two extremely important documents. Um, and I recommend that you at least get those. Uh, they are pretty low cost, cost measures that, uh, uh, should make your life a lot easier if you need them. So, all right, Jenny, I'm just going to beep when I want to uh, change the slides if that's okay. But if that works. Can, uh, that works perfectly. <laughs> okay, beep. Okay, now before we get into uh, the other estate planning documents, primarily wills and living trusts, it's important to uh, determine how all of your property is owned. And what I mean by that is, in what name is the uh, your your property titled? And there's primarily three ways it can be owned. It can be owned by you alone. Um, so I could say Rich Miller owns this house. It's my deed. It's my my uh, property alone. And when I die, it's in my estate. The second way you can own property is by you alone, but the property passes by beneficiary designation on your death. So the primary uh, example of this are your retirement accounts where you name your beneficiaries. And this is really a contract between you and the custody, custodian account holder 
um, that you will transfer those funds on your death to the beneficiary you designated. Uh, life insurance proceeds is another example and pension benefits, same thing. The third type is by property uh, you hold jointly with someone else and which may be inherited by the surviving owner. Uh, you can hold property jointly with someone else. And if you die, maybe say half of that property may be included in your estate. But if you own it with language in the document that says rights of survivorship, then uh, if say there's two people on the document, whoever survives the other ends up owning it. You've basically willed in a way that account to the surviving owner. And those, that's called survivorship rights. Um, you can own property jointly with someone else and it not be survivorship rights. And that's presumed unless you have that word surviving or survivorship in there. So another note is if you own it as husband and wife, it's deemed to be inherited by the surviving owner. So you don't really need those words if it's owned by husband and wife. But that's important for the things we're about to discuss that uh, these are the three ways you own property. The first category by you alone is what you're uh, worried about, if you're worried about it, uh, that will need to be probated because you have, you own this property at death, but you provided no reason by beneficiary designation or any may, maybe survivorship that someone else will inherit this. Therefore, it must be probably will need to be probated unless you've done this. So. Uh, we're going to go first into um, the will. This is the third primary document I've told you about. Um, Jenny, if you could switch. Okay. The will is, remember, the first two of the durable power of attorney, second is advanced directive. The third is the will. The fourth, by the way, is a living trust. But uh, we're going to be talking about the will. Again, this document is necessary if you own property and there's no other way you're gonna dispose of it. So if you own property in your own name and there's no beneficiary designation, no survivorship, then it, it's gonna pass according to this will. And that's why you need a will if you care who your property passes to. But the, the uh, main purposes of will, or excuse me, the main components of the will are number one, you appoint someone to take charge of your estate, and that's called a personal representative. Uh, often it's a good friend of yours, often it's a spouse first, uh, but someone who has a uh, you know, reasonable intelligence level, uh, you may want to appoint. You can appoint a bank, although that can become quite expensive and maybe not needed. Uh, second purpose of the will is dispose of your property any way you want. Uh, this can be done, uh, as much you know any way you imagine you, you can you can dispose of your property that's why it's important uh, uh which i'll mention in a minute when you don't have a will um, then the state decides who's going to get your property but in the will if you write out a will um, you can dispose of the property the way you want there's a lot of other provisions in the will but those are the two main uh main ones you know someone to take charge of your estate and someone to dispose of your estate but you can have funeral instructions if you want to be buried a certain way, if you want to have uh, your body floated out in a body of water and soaked in gasoline and a flaming arrow hitting it. Um, I actually drew up a will provision like that once. I had to put if legal do this, but uh, I really did. Um, you can establish trusts and there'd be an, a number of reasons for trust. This is within the will you would establish the trust. You establish trust for minor children, you can establish trusts uh, for special needs per people. You can um, establish trusts for adult beneficiaries, um, education trusts. Again, you can write this any way you want. You can be specific or as broad uh, as you want in these things. Uh, you can also suggest guardians if you have minor children, who you'd want to take children, if you and your spouse or you and a couple um, um, meet an untimely death. So. There's a lot of other things you can put in a will. Um, and as I said, if you have property that you own alone, you want a will. Beep. 
Jenny, can you move to the next one? All right. If you don't have a will, um, we've talked about this before, but again, it has to do with uh, how the property passes. You have a will, and if you own it on your own name, sorry to keep repeating this, if you own it on your own name, then it goes according to the will. However, if you own jointly owned property as survivorship, then it goes to the survivor. And this can happen in, it has, a, has a, a uses in bank accounts, primarily used in real estate. A lot of real estate has, you know, John Brown and Jim Brown as joint tenants with right of survivorship. And whoever j survives of Jim or John, they end up with the property and they can dispose of it any way they want. It's their property. Uh, second alternatives to a will to avoid probate is beneficiary designations. We've talked about this before. Um, bank accounts have uh, beneficiary designations. They're called pay on death accounts. Uh, there are stock accounts the same way. And even real estate can have uh, beneficiary designations on them. Um, if you do that, I suggest an attorney. Uh, there's some tricks to that. And the fact that you're recording a document with the county recorder's office with a beneficiary designation on it, you got to be very careful about that. Um, the third way to avoid uh, uh, probate is to establish a living trust. And this is simply a document, and we'll get into it a little bit more. A living trust is simply a document which substitutes for a will, but allows you to avoid probate. Um, it, it can, everything you put in a will, you can put in a living trust. And basically you do that under this method. Um, you have a backup will. Uh, that leaves everything you may discover later on uh, that dumps into this living trust. But this is a pure will substitute. Um, and the only purpose of a living trust is to avoid probate. All right, can you move on to the next, Jenny? Okay, now we'll talk a little bit more about this living trust. These things are um, advertised throughout a lot of media, although I think it's been cut down a little bit. Um, the, the reason living trusts came to be was, uh, the exorbitant trustees and attorney's fees that were being paid in California, uh, on sizes on estates. And they would simply be a percentage of the estate, no matter how much work they put into it, uh, say 5% of a $60 million estate. Well, people got tired of these. They didn't want to be subject to those fees anymore. And so they started establishing living trusts. And uh, that way, uh, if there was no probate, there were not these exorbitant fees. So um, that's a little bit different in Oregon. Oregon uh, doesn't have legal fees or trustees fees um, that have to be according to a set percentage. Uh, they are what's known as reasonably necessary fees in administering the estate and, or, you know, reasonable and necessary fees in administering a trusteeship. But uh, the original idea for these came from California where this uh, um, exorbitant compensation was being paid. Can you imagine that to attorneys? Um, anyway, the living trust is a document. You have to set it up during lifetime. It's signed during lifetime by you and as another person or a bank, it can be a bank if you want, but a trustee. And it can also be you during your lifetime. You can be the person that sets up the trust and you can also be the trustee. And that's the way a living trust is often set up. As soon as you die, uh, another trustee, a successor trustee, often a spouse or a family member takes over. But um, in a trust arrangement, the assets, as opposed to just owning them outright when you die, you must, during your lifetime, transfer those assets into the trust. And at that point, you no longer own the assets, the trustee owns the assets, but it's within the trust. And so instead of the assets being, being uh, owned by Joe Smith, it's owned by John Smith as trustee for Joe Smith, because uh, John Smith is the trustee. So uh, the trust can just go on. Um, it really doesn't affect your lifestyle at all during your life. All of these assets are held in trust, but you can own things in your own name that uh, 
that are allow you to operate on a day-to-day -day basis, but your main assets are in trust. And so when you die, uh, theoretically, for this trust to operate, you don't own any property. And so it's not in your estate and it doesn't cast, pass according to your will. The property at your death is still owned by the trustee. It always has been owned by the trustee. And uh, when you die, the trustee looks at the trust and that's where I say it's like a will substitute. And then he or she is um, instructed to handle it pretty much like a will at that point. But again, because the trustee owns it and a person doesn't, it doesn't have to be probated. Now, important thing to remember is that no taxes are saved with a living trust, okay? I know that uh, a lot of these ads, I don't think so as much anymore, but uh, when I was practicing, uh, there were a lot of ads saying, living trust, save taxes. It doesn't save you taxes. There's some income tax savings to it here and there. But as far as death taxes, uh, estate and inheritance taxes, it saves you no money at all. So, beep. Okay, um, let's see. Can you switch that with the other one, the probate with the will? Okay, let's go to this one first. And that small estates would be next, if that's okay. So um, up until now, we've talked about things we're doing at life during lifetime. Now, um, death has occurred, sorry, but uh, we decide what to do with uh, if you have a will. So if you have property, again, that you own outright and uh, it doesn't pass any other way, you have to file a uh, will with the court. Um, you file it with the court, it's admitted, the person who is in charge of the estate, again called the personal representative, is formally appointed, some things are issued that proves his authority to all third persons. The, the personal representative then pays any debts or taxes that are due by you or your estate. Uh, you'll have some maybe income taxes due. Uh, the personal representative will be required to file the income taxes return for your estate. Um, you need to notify creditors of the, excuse me, the personal representative needs to no, notify creditors of debts you may have, uh, needs to give notice to the creditors that, uh, that are known in existence and needs to publish the, uh, the death, the notice of the death in a paper in case anybody um, has any possible claims against the estate. Once that's all done, um, you dispose of property according to the will. However, you set it up under your will, the personal representative disposes of the property that way. Now, the reason uh, probate's kind of a hassle is a lot of court documents involved, uh, depending upon the size of the estate. But, um, you know, there's not, people don't like it because it's not private, but I don't think there's a whole lot of people uh, snooping around the courthouses looking at this stuff. But it is a hassle. I mean, I think that it really adds. Uh, to the expense of administering this estate. Sometimes it's good to have probate, uh, but if you can get away with it in a uh, small family situation, it's better not to have a probate. And not only that, but you can do the same thing in a living trust that you can in a probate, but you got to remember to put your assets into the trust while you're living. Now, you can still have a, a, a court proceeding. A court proceeding will still be required uh, if you own property in your own name and you don't have a will, okay? So if I own property um, and it's just in my own name, the only way to get in anywhere is to have a court proceeding and then determine who it goes to. The difference between having a will and not a will is that the property you own is disposed of according to Oregon statutes. So it will say, for instance, if I die and I own a piece of property and uh, I'm married, that property will definitely go to the spouse, okay? If I have, um, these are just a couple of examples. If I have a spouse and two kids by a prior marriage, half of the, half of the property goes to the spouse and half of the property is split between the children of a prior marriage. Um, so it lays out all these contingencies if you don't have a will, and that's how your property will be disposed of. So, okay, Jenny Beep, small estates affidavit. Can we go to estates? Yeah, there we go. Um, 
Now, here's another out to avoid probate. Um, say you have property that you only know in your own name. Um, as long as it's worth less than $75,000, if it's real property, excuse me, personal property, and that includes stocks, bonds, household goods, you have, you have less than $75,000 uh, in that type of property and less than $200,000 in real property, which is land and improvements, then you don't have to do a probate. Um, you can file an affidavit with the court and uh, within four months, uh, unless you feel, uh, excuse me, four months for creditors purposes, but if you don't have any creditors, you can get the, get the property or transfer the property to the owner um, within four months after death. And so you don't have to go through a probate, probate Whoever is appointed under the small estates affidavit will have the power to go ahead and transfer that property and you're done. That's all you have to do. And so if you have this small, uh, smaller valued pieces of property, uh, this is something you can look into. And also keep in mind that the only property we're talking about here is property that's owned by a person individually with no other way that it passes. So you could have, for instance, a uh, $5 million retirement account. And uh, as long as you have less than $75,000 in household goods and bonds and less than $200,000 in real property, you still don't have to probate that estate. You can go ahead and file one of these small estates affidavits. So uh, again, it helps to uh, have a lot of assets now that can pass by ways other than probate. And you've got to look into those things. You know, most often they're told you, but uh, in planning your estate, you want to keep that in mind. Okay, let's move on, Jenny, to administration of non-probate assets. Right, okay. Um, we've talked about this before. Uh, we know how probate assets and probate-like assets without a uh, will are passed, but Assets that pass by beneficiary designation, it's a pretty easy deal. You just notify the organization, um, uh, administrator of your retirement funds, or maybe an insurance company of death, and uh, note, you know, they'll, they'll ask for the death certificate, and, uh, and, uh, and then you will ask them to go ahead and distribute the funds or re-register an account in the beneficiary's name. Pretty easy to do, a lot easier than probate. Uh, the assets passed by survivorship, this is most often done in real estate, really a lot of, uh, some bank accounts do it, but uh, most often in real estate. And all you have to do, say you have a deed uh, with uh, Joe Brown and Jim Brown, and Joe Brown dies, Jim Brown can take down Joe Brown's death certificate and record it with the county recorder's office. And that's all he'd have to do. And that the uh, property becomes his. And for title purposes, he doesn't have to do anything more. There's no more deeds he has to file. He just has to uh, file the death certificate of the predeceasing owner. So those are, if you can get uh, pro non-probate assets, you can, uh, um, you, you can avoid this hassle. So it's, it's a pretty good, uh, I think you wanna inventory your assets and if, again, determine how you own these assets. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we did have a question come in around this. Um, does Oregon require a personal representative to advertise the estate so that creditors get notice? If so, what is done if you are going to file a small estate affidavit? Yeah, a, a small estate affidavit, it still requires both a probate and a small estate affidavit require you to, number one, notify known creditors, okay? If you know the person who died has creditors, then you got to notify him that, uh, hey, they died and, and we've got an estate here. Uh, that occurs in a small estates affidavit too. In addition to that, you have to file a notice, what's called notice to interesting interested persons. It's basically a notice to creditors that, again, if, you, if anybody that, uh, has any claims against this state, you better you know, let, 
let uh, the personal representative know uh, within four months. So those are the two primary notification procedures. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, let's move on to taxes. This is everyone's favorite subject. By the way, I, this thing is really, uh, this is subject to change. There's a lot of things going on in Congress right now. Um, these, uh, I always had a full employment relief act passed about every three years. I did a lot of tax work and, uh, but pay attention to um, the tax laws in the next year or so, because I think they're gonna change drastically uh, if they're passed, we'll see. But uh, we wanna talk about taxes in the event of death here. Um, but there's two taxes you have to, I would say, worry about a bit. There are two taxes that exist. First, the federal estate tax, which is taxed on your net worth. Uh, however, uh, because of recent legislative changes, um, the first $11.7 million of your estate is exempt from federal estate tax. So, you know, you can be a husband and wife with what, 23, four, 20, $3,400,000, you won't be subject to federal estate tax. Above that, the tax is 40%. So this doesn't apply to uh, many people. Um, I think that exemption, uh, they're toying with bringing that down a little bit. But uh, again, this applies to only a uh, relatively small minority of the American population. The Oregon inheritance tax, if you live in Oregon, that's the one you gotta worry about because um, it's taxed in your net worth, but there's only a million dollar exemption per person. And uh, that's not, um, not, not outside of the realm of possibility like it used to be. And especially if you, you and your spouse uh, have more than $1 million, um, you may want to see an attorney uh, to know how to deal with that because um, sometimes you want you want this $1 million exemption to be used by each spouse. And there's a way you can be kind of tricked into not having each spouse use it. And so if I, I heartily recommend that if you have more than $1 million in property that you see an attorney to avoid this problem. But uh, that tax rate is I believe from 11 to 16%. And a lot of times because um, you could have a $20 million federal estate tax husband and wife you won't have anything, any tax uh, on it at all. But uh, on that kind of um, uh, on that kind of a state, you're liable to have a 1.6 million dollar Oregon inheritance tax. So that's the one you really want to watch out for. Now, a lot of you know, I got the question throughout my career. Well, you get taxed because you receive these assets, and the answer is yes, or generally no, but maybe. Okay. So if I get a house from my brother, um, I'm not gonna be taxed on it from an income tax standpoint. There's no income tax on receiving that house. But if I receive retirement proceeds from my brother, then that will be taxed to me, that will be income tax. So the difference between those two things is if I receive a house during my life, I'm not gonna be taxed on it. But if I, if I receive retirement proceeds during my life, I will be taxed on it. So if I die and I still got retirement proceeds, those retirement proceeds are gonna be taxed to the person who inherits it. Uh, the other example is pension plans, but the, the IRS wants to make sure that, you know, on these retirement proceeds, you got a deduction theoretically when you, you contributed to the retirement account and they want that to be taxed coming back out when you withdraw it, when it doesn't matter whether it's you or it's your beneficiary, uh, those proceeds will be taxed. But other than that, you can inherit a lot of things, but no income tax will be due. So that's uh, the that's the end of this talk webinar as far as the presentation stage goes. Jenny, I'd be willing to take any questions or uh, clarify things or explain anything better. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, we did get one other question just came in. Um, about inheriting. So if you inherit funds in an IRA, is it taxed as of the date of inheritance or when the beneficiary retires? 
it's taxed. It's based upon the. <laughs> there's a, these, this is pretty tough, but the, the, the uh, custodian of the account will you will usually give you the options. You can take. Uh, um, a, we're not talking about the estate tax. We're talking about the income tax, but um, generally you're allowed to. Uh, you need to set, establish a separate account for that. It's called an inherited IRA account. And you have to take that income out over the life expectancy, um, over your life expectancy. Okay, so the beneficiary's life expectancy. Now, they've just changed that with the last tax act, I believe, when I believe minors have to take it out with, excuse me, they have to take it out within 10 years now but it's not taxed immediately. It's deferred uh, either over the life expectancy or 10 years. I, you'd have to check on that. But the, but the, the answer is it's not, it's not taxed immediately. I know that. Excellent. I've got an, Any other questions? Yeah, I got another couple here. Uh, so yeah. what person dies without any assets, do you have to put in no, notice to creditors when there's no money to pay them no no you know i received a uh, the lawyers in the library program that i do uh, this guy's brother had received a claim for about five thousand dollars from a credit card company and he wanted to know uh if he had any liabilities for his brother's debts and i said no you don't have any liability for your brother's debts uh um you know that's it's totally your brother's debts and that's all there is and so, uh, you know, they will do that. The credit card companies will do that. They will go after relatives, not go after them, but certainly make inquiries. And, uh, but if you don't have any money to pay, there's no need to do anything. Uh, really isn't, so. And then I've got a third question here. Now, can you define what the probate process really means. So I'm guessing that's just like, what, what, what is probate? Why, what, why does okay. this, what does it okay, do? A probate process, you file a document with the court petitioning the court to admit the will to probate and appointing a personal representative. Okay. And so the court, the judge looks at that. Uh, he says, okay, uh, this looks like a good will. Uh, and I'm going to appoint this person. He's qualified to act as personal representative, and he's going to take charge of this estate. Okay. And so then the personal representative uh, has these documents. They're called letters, testamentary, and he does everything he needs to do to settle debts of the decedent, the person that dies, and also to pay taxes if there's any taxes. Um, this will take a minimum of four months, but he has to do these things and has to file uh, recordings with the court saying he's done these things. Then he has to give notice to the beneficiaries under the will saying, hey, you're entitled to such and such and such and such. Uh, when we we're done with the state uh, uh, administration process, you will receive your property and you'll give a full account, you'll get a full accounting of the estate. Uh, so there's a lot of duties that the personal representative has to, uh, to, uh, to carry out under the auspices of the court. Uh, so it's all done proper. And at the end, um, the property is distributed to the beneficiaries. <coughs> Excuse me, the personal representative is paid a fee, the attorneys are paid their fee and the court discharges the personal representative and that's the end of the process. Uh, there's a minimum of four months on that because creditors are given four months to file a claim with the court against the estate. That's it for that. I hope that clarifies things. Yeah. And, and for any, again, I, you know, in this, in this webinar setup, um, since, you know, we can't really have a dialogue with people if, if you have, follow-up questions, just feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I do have another couple of questions that have come in. Um, so how much does it cost generally to set up a living trust? Um, the living trust will, will cost no more than a will. Say you have a um, 
husband and a wife, husband, and you know, whatever, a couple, um, and two children. Generally, to set up a living trust, I would think that would cost around $1,200 altogether. What you have is you drop, all, you know, when I say that, it's kind of a package deal. What I used to charge was that includes the durable power of attorney and advanced directive, the living trust, and then you need wills. They're called pour over wills. And what those are for is if you don't know that you own some property and it's later found out that you own it, then the will says it needs to go in your trust. So you draw those things up. So I would guess about twelve fifty for all of those things. But where the cost may uh, include, uh, may get higher, is when you have to transfer a lot of assets. So if you have 50 pieces of property, you got to pay for 50, 50 deeds, things like that. Um, so really, a lot of the cost, uh, they're generally more expensive than a will because you're making these transfers. And so that uh, the cost is generally uh, determined by the number of transfers you have to make into the trust. Excellent. And then um, does the surviving spouse owe Oregon inheritance tax? Does the surviving, okay. If you have all of, all of your property going to the surviving spouse, then uh, the surviving spouse qualifies for what's known as a marital deduction. And there is no tax on that, okay? Um, again, um, you don't often want to do that. You may want to set up a trust. This is why I say you might want to see a lawyer. But if you leave all property to the surviving spouse, then the property, the surviving spouse may have a bigger estate than she otherwise wouldn't. She may be maybe in excess of a million dollars, and then you'd have to pay tax on the estate. So uh, there's a ways you can use your million dollar exemption under the Oregon law and the marital deduction. So you pay no tax anyway. And I suggest that you, you see a lawyer if you're in that situation. Excellent. Well, that is all the questions that have come in. Um, if anybody has any further questions for Rich while well, we've got him in the hot seat, uh, feel free to put that in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, I am going to put a link in the chat for the Oregon State Bar's uh, public information page on wills and uh, estate planning. So if you do want further information, um, that's always a good place for general information. Um, and then as, as Rich has said a, a few times during this, when you get more uh, specific, uh, you might wanna uh, check in with an actual attorney. Um, I've got another question here. Did you really have to go to law school for three years? <laughs> Did I? Yeah, that was like, that was probably the worst three years of my life. Um, <laughs> I went in Salem, Oregon. And uh, I came from Colorado, which is kind of sunny. Yeah. In, 19, in 1973, it was the worst winter in, uh, for rain in Portland in 30 years. So, or in Salem for 30 years. So, uh, yeah, I really did have to go for three years. But, uh, you know, life is tough. Well, maybe it was easier to stay inside and study when it was just raining all it, the time. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and then a follow-up to that. Did you know anyone who enjoyed law school and why? <laughs> I, I, I can answer that honestly. Uh, no one that I know enjoyed law school. No one. No one. So maybe some nerd I don't know about. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Rich. We've really appreciated thank all Thank you for the panelists. Thank, or you, thank you for the people that showed up. Yeah. And thank you to the participants. Um, we did record this session, so it should be on the library's YouTube page in the next couple of days or within the week. Um, and if you have further questions, uh, feel free to contact me at the Downtown Bend Library. Uh, we do have a lot of resources on wills and estate plannings um, in, our, in our law library collection. So um, look for it there. All right, thank you, Rich. All right, bye-bye. Thanks everybody, good night. <laughs>